you turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Tonight's topic, uh, evangelism and warfare. And we will not just discuss evangelism and warfare, but warfare. And obviously we make application to the idea of uh, just spiritual warfare in a person's life. I was talking with Pastor Schaller about this on the telephone before I came down. And we were talking about in the garden, Jesus said, I could have called 12 legions of angels to come to my defense. 72,000 angels were right there waiting for somebody, for him to say, do something. 72,000 angels were like right there. And he said, I, he didn't. I could have called 72,000 angels, but I did not. And we see the incredible spiritual warfare. And I think so often in believers' lives, that's uh, because of a lack of maturity, a lack of Christian growth. Maybe Satan has done a great job of blinding people's minds. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 and 3.14 says he blinds people's minds, a mind blinder. And so they, they do not see the light and if I do not see the light, how will I know um, what's going on in my life without light from God and light from the Word and light from grace and light from the finished work? I will not see what's taking place. And I will maybe just make decisions based upon the past or based upon what I think is a good idea or a feeling, but I will never make decisions based upon uh, understanding spiritual warfare. A lot of people make a lot of decisions as Christians that are really interesting. Uh, they decide to move away from Baltimore. They decide to do this. They decide to do that. And I wonder really where they get their input from before they make those decisions. And so the devil would love to have us just think that he doesn't exist. And so in Ephesians chapter 6, I, this, real, this verse really struck me this afternoon when I was looking at it in verse We'll start in verse 11, but I want, to, I want us to look at the whole thing. I'll, we'll read it, and I'll come back to my point. It says, Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And we're going to see in this portion of Scripture seven different things that's said about the enemy and the hierarchy. Seven different things. Put on the whole armor of God, not just part of the armor. Imagine going out to face somebody with half the armor. What do you think he's going to shoot at where there's no armor? Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand, I'm sorry, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And that means the thought out progressive procedures of the devil. For we wrestle not, and you, just think about how many times it says against here. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And that's, that to me is what a statement that is. Do you and I realize we are not wrestling flesh and blood? That means you're not even wrestling yourself. Because you and I are flesh and blood. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. And Paul certainly was talking about the war that was going on within him. But who is it that uses the old sin nature but demons and the devil? So we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's not your marriage it's not, it's not your husband, not your wife, not people around you, not your kids, not somebody in the church at all. I mean, is this statement true? We wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's pretty, that's pretty clear. So any difficulty I have with another person, it's just the enemy trying to use the situation to cause me to go the other way. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against the spiritual wickedness in high places. And we will define those four aspects right there. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. It says it twice. Pretty important, huh? Take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be, able, may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, 
wherewith you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the word of the Spirit, which is and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And this is the verse that speaks about evangelism and, and the, the connect of the armor to evangelism. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Okay, now, uh, we started, we, we did this in Finland, Pirio remembers, when we were there. We talked about the enemy, if you are in a war and the enemy is coming in, whether you are whatever side you're on, and you have an objective to attack, what you would like to do was cut off communication lines. If you can cut the communication lines, he cannot relate to anybody else. Like say here's the battalion right here, you attack the battalion, you love to cut communication lines off so they cannot call for help. So there is no help and you've got them surrounded. So the enemy wants to cut three major communication lines for the believer. Are you with me? Yes. You sure? Okay. Three lines for the believer. Three lines for the church. Three lines for the believer. Cutting off three communication lines. Communication line number one, God's word to the church and to me personally. If the enemy can cut that off, now of course we appreciate the Bible, we love the Bible and all of that, but if the enemy can cut the communication line of God's word, and that's if you look at Acts chapter 6 verses 1 through 7, you will see why they said we must give ourselves continually to the ministry of the word and prayer. So let me cut off their relationship to the Bible. Let me cut the pulpit's relationship to the Bible. And by the way, he has been very successful in America in doing that. Cutting off the communication line. So that you can enter a church and you hardly ever hear doctrine taught, spoken of. You don't hear messages. I heard thrown words a number of times on the way over on this last trip. Dr. Stevens quoted 165 verses in one message. Or gave reference to them. As I was, I was listening, he didn't always say the verse, but I was listening and putting it down. 165 verses in one message. I don't think you could listen to, I think you could listen to some messages and lucky if you found them opening up to the Bible and then just talking nonsense for 45 minutes and not hear anything about the, about the scriptures. So Satan and the demons, and there's millions of them, would love to cut off the communication of God's word primarily to the pastor, because the pastor's in the pulpit, and then to the church, and then to the individual believer. And to cut that communication line means I am left to myself. I, have no, I cannot think with God. I do not even know God. I'm in situations where I cannot apply God's mind. And there I am. And in warfare, cut the line. Let me cut the line. Let me make them so sick, so tired, so aggravated, so fed up with life situations that they don't even think about the importance of going to the Bible. That's why we're a Bible-believing church. And we, we, are, we are saying we're not going to cut the communication line. We're not going to allow the communication line to be cut. And it's sad to say, but you meet believers all the time and they, they don't know how to think with God. And you recognize even in a church where the line is not cut, it's been cut in their personal lives. It's been cut. And you know what? You you try to figure out what's wrong with the marriage, what's wrong with the person, what's wrong with the family, what's wrong with the teenager. And it's really simple. The line's been cut. That's all it really is. There's no relationship with the scriptures. And that's the warfare of the enemy. So you don't blame them. Certainly they're not making a right decision. But you realize that we wrestle not against what? Flesh and blood. Cut the line. Cut the line. If the if the uh, enemy can cut the line to the wife, there's going to be problems for the husband. If he can cut the line to the husband, there's going to be problems for the wife. If he can cut the line to the husband and wife, there's going to be problems for the children. Uh, teenagers, young people, if he can cut the line to people in the body when somebody has a viewpoint that's spiritually speaking right on target, they don't want to hear it because their line has been cut. Are you with me? Are you awake? 
Why would I say that? Uh, cut the line. Cut the line. And really, just to get Peter not fellowshipping with Jesus in any area, cut the line. Cut that communication line. And therefore, you have church after church. There's the biggest problem with America and the world is that the enemies cut the line. Well, you know, you got somebody, you know, you know what drives me nuts? So many people are so concerned about governments and politics and plans and this thing. You know what? You're just wasting your mental energy. It is such nonsense. What does God care about who's the president of the United States or who's the, in charge of Russia? If, he's, if there's a line, if the communication line is there, everything's going to be okay for the church. He's, he's concerned with the church. He's not concerned with all these other things. You know, I, I, I find that so many people consumed and tired out, worn out, trying to figure out what's going on in the United States or in Europe or over here or over there. What's the big deal? What's the big deal? Just keep the line going, right? You, could, you know, you could get, you, we could worry and have anxiety and it could cut the line. So he says, I want to cut that line from God's word speaking to me, God's word speaking to the church, God's work, word speaking to everybody, uh, head of the family and the marriage. So cut the line. Line number two. I want to cut line number two. It's me speaking to God. Prayer. If the enemy can cut the line, why pray? It doesn't do any good. God doesn't answer prayer, does he? We would never say that with our lips. But I wonder if our hearts don't believe that. Cut the line. Prayer? Praying church? Praying family? Praying pastor? Praying children? Praying Bible school? Prayer. Cut the line. That's the second communication line. God to me, the word, me to God. Prayer. Cut the line. Cut the line. Boy, that's happening all over the place. Oh. What should we do about what's going on? How about praying to God? Huh? How about praying to God? He can have Sennacherib's sons kill him on the way back. <laughs> right? Because they're going to hear a rumor, and don't worry about him, Hezekiah, Isaiah, when he goes back, his own kids will kill him. <laughs> it's just like crazy, you know? Just pray to God. Prayer. Prayer. Prayer changes lives. The third communication line is the line of the gospel, me speaking to people about God. Cut the line. So if the enemy can cut those three lines, God's word speaking to me, my prayer speaking to God, and my words preaching to people, he's going after those three communication lines. And if he can get them, he's got me. I'm saved, I'll go to heaven, but I'll go to heaven with the communication lines cut. All these wires, all these uh, severed wires hanging off my head. Walking around with wires hanging off my head, you know. Like, what, what's going on? Cut the line. And so here we are trying to figure out what's wrong with this, what's wrong with him, what's wrong with her, what's wrong with them, what's wrong with the church, what's wrong with relationships, what's wrong with the kids, what's wrong with my finances, what's wrong with America, what's wrong with Europe. And God said, this is just three lines. It's just three lines. That's all. Stop, stop. Like, you know, we go so in-depth with our intricate minds. And we come away from the simplicity that's in Christ. It's so simple. Cut the lines. What do you think, the, what do you think the, uh, is, the, is the fruit of a ministry? It's, it's the word, prayer, and preaching the gospel. So that's a little too easy, Pastor Shabelli. Like, come on, can't you make it a little bit more, you know, difficult to understand? Or, I mean, couldn't you like, you know, don't you understand what's going on in the world? Huh. Maybe not. Maybe it's good not to understand what's going on. Maybe who cares what's going on? It's amazing to me. So cut the lines. So this is spiritual warfare. Cut the lines. This is warfare. And so when you, and by the way, if I can cut the line, listen, listen, to, listen to this uh, little statement that Jesus makes to the next pastor. Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you and the Amplified does a great job. He's demanded you back for himself. <laughs> he wants you back. He had you before. By the way, did you know that the devil had us before we got saved? You didn't think so, did you? You thought you were just a good person who was just a little bit disturbed, spiritually speaking. No, you were Satan's property. You were owned by the devil. What do you mean? What? What? 
Imagine going up and telling like sophisticated, intelligent people with a lot of money that you're owned by Satan. <laughs> they would not be happy with that statement. They would call you a fanatic, mentally ill, and have you committed. Simon, Simon. By the way, he didn't say Peter, did he? The devil can never get Peter. He can only get Simon. He can only penetrate the old sin nature. He can never penetrate the new person. He can go after Saul, but he can't get Paul. Are you listening? Huh? Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you. He wants you for himself. He wants you back. And I have, I like this, don't you? I like this how it says in the Amplified. But I have especially prayed for you. That your faith fail not. That you do not fail with your faith. And when, I like the promise here, and when you are what? Converted. Strengthen your brethren. You're, gonna, you're not going to make it. You are not going to make it, but I already know it. And I prayed for you. He's not going to get you back. He might cause you to fall for a moment, but he can't have you back. You are owned by God now. You are owned by God. He's going right after Simon. Doesn't that give us an indication when Paul talks about the enemy and the thorn in his flesh? Doesn't it make us understand something in Zechariah chapter 3 that he's going first and foremost after leadership? That's why we're, supposed to, we're not supposed to criticize leadership. We're supposed to pray for them. Amen? They, we are sinners saved by grace. We make mistakes. But who needs everybody to be assaulting us constantly? You should be praying. That's what Jesus, by the way, that's what Jesus did for Peter. But I have what? <laughs> I sent an email out about you. So nobody would listen to you. Huh? But I have prayed for you. And you're going to be converted. And when you're converted, strengthen your brethren. And so he's going after leadership. And leadership in any realm, whether it's uh, in a church, first and foremost, in a family, all right, in, in, in a, any relationship like that, he's going after somebody, a father, so he can somehow get the kids in a place that they should not be at all. So we're talking about warfare. Now let me give you five kinds of warfares. And probably there's, there's more, but five warfares. And by the way, please do not become subjective at a class like this. Some people get weird and subjective, start to look in, inwardly. They get introspective, begin to judge themselves. When Paul says, I can't even judge myself until the time the Lord comes, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. It's a small thing if you judge me. I can't judge myself. I never worry about people judging me because Paul said, it's a very small thing if you judge me. A big deal. I've had so many people that have like done that. I could care less. It's a small thing if you judge me, Corinthians. I can't even judge myself. Isn't that a good statement? Hey, maybe you're right. I can't even judge myself. Until the time the Lord comes, somebody said to me, well, you, you uh, didn't teach, you, you, you said the wrong word. That wasn't that word. Or you made a mistake in your preaching. And I'm thinking like, you know what? God love you for sitting there and instead of listening, being a critical analyzer of what's said. Critical analyzers will never grow. Because all they're doing is, is analyzing and evaluating everything that's preached or taught or said, looking at a book to find something wrong. You'll find plenty wrong in in a person's life if you're really looking hard enough. Very interesting. Five types of warfare. Warfare number one. So don't get introspective. Let the Holy Spirit convict us in areas, but let's recognize we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. All right? It's not flesh and blood. It's not the Democratic Party, the Republican Party. It's not uh, the head of Hamas. It's not the, uh, the president of Russia. It's not the hierarchy of China. It's we wrestle not against what? So would people knock it off and stop looking at talk shows that drain their brain and leave them without energy? That they can't even, they can't even think correctly because all they know is what's going on with a, an NCC or a CNN and a, and, and a Fox News or a newspapers, a Baltimore Sun, and they're so wrapped up, and even pastors, I can't even believe it. Somebody was telling me there's a real problem in one of our churches because the person that's an assistant pastor, all they do is talk about politics. And he says, it's very draining. And it's all they talk about. And they're, and they're not even in America, and they're more concerned with what's going on here than we are. I just happen to be in another kingdom. So if you want to talk about what's going on in this kingdom, be, feel free. Don't talk to me about it, though. 
Don't drain my brain with this. So, warfare. Are you ready? War that's going on in me. Did you ever realize there's a war in you? Hello? Anybody here? Yeah, I call it, they call it the flesh against the spirit. The old man against the new man. Have you ever realized that from Galatians 5, 19 to 22? Have you ever woke up and felt you were in a war zone? <laughs> you can be sleeping and you're in a war zone. You're in a war zone. It's a war in me. Do this. No, don't do that. Pray. No, don't pray. You're tired. Get, no, and that, you know, that's amazing. Like, I, I always thought, about, like, what, is, what about just believing God for some things? Just simple faith in God? Huh? Wow. Whenever I mention that something's wrong with me, I get 17 different people, which is good. I understand their heart. They got 17 solutions for me. And I put all those pieces of paper in a bucket and feed them to Steve Merlo's cat. <laughs> Pastor Steve Merlo. No, I'm just joking. I mean, what about God? What about God healing? You know, what about God intervening? What about God? There's a war going on in us. And the scriptures tell us that. It's very evident. Did you ever notice that? Have you ever noticed that? Pastor Gene, Sonny McDonald, huh? Molly Harrison, huh? Lucy. I don't care. The newest of us and the oldest of us in the faith. There's a war going on in me. And it's the and Paul said it, and he was 30 years an apostle. Every time I try to do good, I find evil present in me, O wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from this body of sin and death? I thank God for Jesus Christ. There's a war going on in the Apostle Paul. A war. My little body's a war zone. You know, it's a war zone. I don't have to go. I don't have to go find the war zone. It is a war zone. I don't have to go looking for one. All I got to do is look in the mirror. But I see myself in the finished work, and then I I recognize there's a war going on. Pray. You're too tired. Study. Oh, come on. Come on, what are you studying for? Nobody's going to listen tonight anyway. Huh? No, there's a war going on. It's a war. Tell somebody about Christ. What are you, crazy? They're going to laugh at you. A war going on. <laughs> a simple prayer. Are you going to go to 17 doctors to find out what's wrong with you? Don't get introspective. Our first move is doctor, doctor, doctor. I need a doctor. How about the great physician touches garments? Jeez, unbelievable. I have never met so many believers that are so consumed. And they're, as soon as something is wrong, they're running for the prescription. The prescription, the doctor, the hospital. Ah, I got to go there. Oh, don't take it with the balance. Times that God will direct you there. When God directs you there, you go. But that shouldn't be my first bent. <laughs> I bet you if, if, if all of you lived in Africa, your first bent wouldn't be a doctor. In some countries, you go there and you would, a guy, tried, a guy was trying to take my appendix out and I had a kidney stone. I decided I wasn't going to the doctor too often in Ghana. Sorry about that. Don't erase it either. I don't care. No, he's like, we got to take your appendix out right now. I'm like, I don't think it's my appendix. God didn't tell me it was my appendix. We're taking it out right now. It's an emergency. It was a stone. Olive oil in the past. I just drank some olive oil and there it went. Who needs a doctor to drink olive oil? I'm sorry, nurse. You know what I mean. Huh? It's unbelievable. So there's a war going on in me. A war. I can't do that. I can. I can't. I can. I should. I won't. Back and forth. Huh? What kind of a difference am I going to make in Sicily? <laughs> there's a war going on in me. War number one. And it's like, wow. Guess what? You're always going to be on the battlefield, then, aren't you? Aren't we always going to be on the battlefield? If the battlefield is in us? Isn't that what the song once was said by somebody who sang here? There was a war. Of, uh, I had to let God finish the work in me. I think, I think uh, Daryl and Veronica used to sing something like that. War number two. A war in relationships. Are they godly and doctrinal? In a marriage in the body of Christ, in the family, friends, and, and co-laborers where I work, even with uh, people. Our, there, there's a war. The enemy would love to have us have relationships that are not spirit-filled or doctrinal in content. And so that war goes on. 
so that we would look at each other from the natural perspective. A war in relationships. I mean just in the body. I'm not talking about marriage only or uh, anything like that. But I'm talking about in the body of Christ. There's all kinds of things happening. Peter and Paul are pitted against each other over doctrine. Peter separates himself from Gentiles when the Jews come up. And Paul has to go to war against Peter, even in their relationships. And I'll tell you, like, if I'm not spiritual and my wife is spiritual, she confronts me and it's a what? It's a war. It's a war. It's not a little game. It's not playing a game of wind up the dolly and let it spin. You know, it's a war. There's a war going on. There's a war going on in relationships. Number three, there's a war in the atmosphere. Have you ever noticed? All you got to do is go to, a, go to a border sometime. You know, borders are where one set of demons meet another. Because demons are assigned to countries. And if you don't believe me, just read Daniel 10. They're assigned to countries. Certain demons are for certain countries. If you go to borders and you can't even believe the tension, it's like they're fighting each other for property rights. There's a war in the atmosphere. There's an atmosphere. Satan is the prince of the power of the what? Of the air, the lower atmosphere. And there's angels and there's demons. And there's a war going on. There's a war going on in the atmosphere. And that is absolutely true. If you just read Daniel 10, please do that. And you and I can see, and you can look through the book of Revelation and see the war that's going on in the atmosphere that we happen to be living in. So you go to work or something, and what do you think is going on? I can't believe how wicked it is there. Really? Do you ever read the Bible? The Bible will tell you it's an atmosphere of evil. All right? And so you got angels and demons, and then you go into some places, and, and uh, you can sense that you come to church, and it's like, wow, what an amazing spiritual atmosphere in the church, an atmosphere of faith, a war in the atmosphere. Number four, a war as we are in this world. Jesus said, in this world you shall have what? A fun time and lots of joy. In this world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Okay? There's a war going on. We are in this world, a war in the world. The culture, uh, the morals, all the things that are going on all over the place. You know, it's amazing. Make sure if you go to Canada that you don't say anything about homosexuals. Well, I hope this class goes to Canada because God hates homosexuality. So as this is on the, live on the Internet, if you're in Canada, you just heard me say it. Come and get me. No, it's a war. There's a war going on in this world. Think about it. What's going, what's the, the world is alien from God. There's a war going on in this world all over the place. I mean, it's just like from, from moral values. I mean, you think about the things that are acceptable now that never were acceptable before. And not that it was any better before, but it was, it's amazing to me. You never heard of some of the things you hear of now because the night is far spent. Romans 13, verse 12. The night is what? Far spent. So there's a war in this world. And number five, the fifth war that we're in is a war to win people to Christ with the gospel. Penetration and evangelism. You'll find out when you do it, there's a war going on. There's a war trying to penetrate Islam. There's a war trying to penetrate China. There's a war trying to penetrate orthodoxy, wherever it may be. There's a war trying to penetrate uh, Hindu, the Hindu world. There's a war. And so don't think I'm going to be able to go out there and do that and not face a what? A war. We are out today with the, uh, uh, what was it, 10th, 11th, and 12th graders? I don't even know. What was the period? Do you know? 9 to 11. We take 9 through 11 out on evangelism, something I did in 1986. 24 years later, it's me out there with gray hair, grayer hair, still doing the same thing, taking Christian school children on evangelism. I can call them children even though they're 16 and 17 years old. So I'm inside, I'm inside the, uh, the market today, and I got this stick, and it says, you know, it's the one that they have for the farmers, that, that measuring rod, and it says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. So they say you can't pass out tracks. I walk up to people and say, read this. Guy thought, a couple people thought I was going to hit him with it. Guy backed up. I, I said, read this. He said, for God so. 
I, they said, I can't give. I said, imagine the absurdities of these authorities saying, I can't give all literature in this market. Isn't that absurd? That's not right, they said. Sorry, Lucy. I yelled too loud. Got bad ears. That's not right. I said, you're right. It's not right. I got so many people agreeing with me. I sat down. There was a table full of a few people there. I said, read the stick. Read this stick. And they said, wow. Yes, he does love me. You know, and I met like backslidden Christians and people that were in there. And I had a play ticket with an eyeball on it. Doesn't that ticket have an eyeball on it? I got the stick and the eyeball. I said, what a, what a tool this is. They can't tell me to not pass out tickets. And I just stood right in front of everybody and just did it. And you know what? You do what you're going to do, and I'll do what I'm going to do. And let's see who wins. We have victory. You say, are you, tell, are you saying we should break the law? What do I care? What do I, when, it, when it comes to preaching the gospel, that's exactly what it's going to be. I had the stick. Read the stick. Nobody could say anything because when somebody came the other way, I turned it over and it was just a ruler. <laughs> Actually, one of the authority guys said to me, I like what you're doing. I'll just, I'll just walk the other way. I said, yeah, don't you have a lot of business down that end of the mall? See that end down there? I see a robbery getting ready to take place. <laughs> I said, I think down there is going to be a robbery. You should go down that end. He goes, oh, okay. <laughs> You got to use your spiritual intelligence. So there's a war penetration with the gospel. And we can see it everywhere that we go. A war in the penetration of the gospel. Now, in Ephesians chapter 6, I want to give you uh, five points that you see here in Ephesians 6 that I think are very important in warfare. Five points. And, and I, I just love it. I, I love. I want you to read, if you have a chance, Ephesians 119, 316 through 20, and then 610. 119 and 20, 316 through 20, and 610. Those three portions of Scripture have pretty much the same words for being strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. And God is telling us, to be strong for warfare. But first of all, he wants you to know in Ephesians 1 who you are. God doesn't say jump into battle without knowing who you are. Are you with me? That's why Bible college is important. That's why the pulpit's important. Uh, it's, it's amazing. I was like, I was not happy with Wednesday night's attendance. And I told Pastor Shallow that, you know what? What the heck's going on? Why, why, where are people anyway? What are they doing? What could they be doing on a Wednesday? I know the kids got to get in dead early. Oh, let them stay up till 11 o'clock. Who cares? God can quicken them too. Why don't we, why do we have to think so commonly natural? Huh? Come on to church. You can't grow going to church once a week. That drives me nuts when I see that. But I'm not the pastor, so I don't say anything. I like Dr. Stevens. You know what he said? You won't come out Wednesday and Sunday night. I'm going to find another church I want to plant another one. I'm leaving you. I mean, he was very, I mean, you, how many heard that statement? If you won't come out three times a week, I'm doing something else. I said that every place I went. You know, this is, what, what is going on here? Wow. We had half the people on Wednesday night. Oh, I got a headache. Well, why don't you let God heal you? Well, it's too far to drive. Why don't you let God take the wheel, the steering wheel? Oh, I got to work late. Quit your job. Get a job that you can come to church. I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, I'm not sorry. Uh, you know, really, it's the craziest thing, you know? The craziest thing is like, whatever happened to church attendance, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together? Wow. So that's, I don't get it. I just don't get it, you know? We got people of other faiths blowing themselves to schmitherines at 15 years old, and we can't come to church? People detonate themselves. I think they're pretty dedicated to their cause, even though it's a wrong one, and they're half out of their minds, Right? But it's amazing to me. You ever heard that story that Wormbrandt told about Ragazinikov, 17-year-old girl? They, they imprisoned and killed her parents. So she walked in to the police station in uh, St. Petersburg, and she pulled out a revolver and shot the captain through the head at the police station. She asked to see the captain. She shot him right through the forehead, killed him. Then they took her to the party headquarters, Communist Party headquarters, and they found 18 pounds of explosives in her dress. She was going to detonate the whole party headquarters. And you know what she said in the last note that she wrote? My only fear in life is that I would have a, I would have a life that meant nothing. 
I was like, I read that. Now, Wormbrand was just saying, okay, I know that's fanatical and crazy, but she was pretty serious, huh? I mean, she was pretty serious. And like, you know, Christianity is just kind of walking around with their lukewarm attitudes and whatnot. They don't realize, people don't realize we're in a war. This is a war. And imagine like, you know, you send, sending people out on the battlefield that don't even, can't even come to church once a week, but they want to be involved in a war. Very interesting. Five points. Are you ready? Okay. Five points on, in Ephesians chapter 6. Number one, he talks about, and this is in 6, 10 to 18. He talks about standing. He talks about stand three times. Stand. Hestimai in the Greek. And really that speaks of the finished work. In warfare, we must understand that we stand in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Where do I stand in this warfare? I stand victorious. I stand with a defeated enemy. I stand in my place in Christ. And we said in Ephesians chapter 1, a believer must know where they stand. You're not going to get in a fight unless you understand and you have knowledge of your standing in Christ. So Paul keeps saying, stand, Ephesians, stand. Do you know where you stand? You can't withstand unless you know where you stand. So your standing is in Christ. We have a position in Christ. And the battle is whose? It's the Lord's. Isn't that good? 1 Samuel 17, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. The battle is the Lord's. Number two, the second point is take. He says it three or four times. Take. What's that? That's grace. Take. Decomei. Be a receiver. Take. 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 You keep taking. You're a receiver. You take. So grace, we don't just stand in the finished work, but we are on a daily basis being receivers of the grace of God. Take the whole armor of God. Take the shield of faith. Take the sword of the Spirit. Everything about the armor has got to do with taking. If I don't take, what's going to happen? I'm, I'm standing in Christ, but everything, I'm, I'm like, here, here's the sword of the Spirit. No, no. Here's a shield of faith. No. Take it. Just put your hand on it. It's all grace. Take. 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 Number three. Point number three. Put on. That's faith. Put it on. What you take, you put it on. Right? You put on what you take. You stand, you take, you put on. Number four. The ability of God. He keeps saying over and over you are able, that you are able, that you are able. The ability is not in us, it's in God himself. Then, number five, you fight. There's where the fighting comes. You don't, you don't fight and then, you know, you, you, what, you stand, you take, you put on, you have God's ability, then you fight. Unfortunately, a lot of people get it all backwards. They want to fight without doing all the other things. They want to fight without, without doing everything else. Oh, forget about everything else. So we are in a warfare. Now, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul states a lot about this in the second epistle to the Corinthians. And we wrestle not against what? Flesh and blood. He, was, he understood the problems that were going on in Corinth, but he also understood that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. And if I can understand my enemy, if I know the devices of the devil and the wiles of the devil, then I will understand that it's not this person or that person. It's not flesh and blood. So 2 Corinthians chapter 10. It says this. Verse 1. Now I, Paul, beseech... Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold towards you. But I beseech you. You see that he says that twice. He's begging them. He's encouraging them. He's saying, you know, I beseech you and I beg you. I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For, we, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not what? War in the flesh. Now, isn't that, isn't that what takes place in so many people's lives? 
They're warring in the flesh. And it's exhausting. It's exhausting. Trying to be spiritual with the flesh. Trying to be a good Christian. How many people here have tried to be a good Christian? Aren't you tired? Aren't you frustrated? Aren't you anxious? I'm trying to be a good Christian. I want to be a good Christian. <laughs> well, you've got the Holy Spirit in you. That's all you have to do is just yield to him. We, don't, we, we walk in the flesh, but we don't what? War after the flesh. David said, don't give me Saul's armor. I can't even put it on. Saul is like a head taller than everybody else. You know what Saul's armor would have looked like on David? He goes, I'll tell you what I need is five smooth stones. That's all. I'm not going to war in the flesh. And by the way, David was called a youth by five people. In 1 Samuel 17 and 18, he was called just a stripling. The word for Hebrew for youth is stripling, a little kid. What's this little kid want? Goliath said, <laughs> just a baby, just a youth. His father said he's a youth. His brother, Eliab, he's a youth. Abner said he was a youth. Saul said he was a youth. Hey, what's the kid want? He's supposed to be bringing up bread and cheese. He's supposed to bring up uh, Swiss sandwiches, Swiss uh, cheese sandwiches with bread. That's his job. You just bring the bread and cheese and be quiet. He goes, oh, by the way, I see somebody's mocking you big warriors. No, do you know what? how many people could, could have fought Goliath that were there? Abner, Saul, the, some of the whatever, even the mighty men, right? They were around then. No, but little David stepped up. And he said, you know what? Your head's coming off, baby. I'm taking your head off. Just like that. And so he, didn't, he did not war after the flesh. It was a, he knew it was spiritual warfare. And that's where churches get tired. People give up. Mission, missionaries quit. People say, I'm not going to go into all the world with the gospel. Oh, are you kidding me? Who could do that? That's too much. When does it stop? And, how, and, all, all, and on and on it goes. Why? Because their war is in the what? It's in the flesh. By the way, doing the will of God is very easy for those who are in the spirit. It's the flesh that can't handle it. And by the way, it's good flesh. Good flesh trying to do God's work. Good flesh trying to do God's work is where all the misery comes in. Good flesh. So he says, we, don't, we, we may walk in the flesh, but we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not human. Carnal means human. They're not human. They're not natural. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. How many people have experienced defeat while they have a finished work victory because they've tried to fight with human weapons in the flesh. They think in hum with humanity. They act with humanity. They decide with humanity. They go forward with humanity. And they just say Christianity doesn't work. It just doesn't work. So the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of what? Strongholds. You ever see anybody with a stronghold? Maybe you're saying, I don't have to see anybody. I have to just look in the mirror. We all have strongholds. There's something about everybody in this room that's a stronghold. But it says they are mighty through God to the what of strongholds? Bringing them down. Okay, bringing them down where they belong. Pulling them down. James and John have a stronghold of anger and it's pulled down by God's finished work. And I don't care what your stronghold is. God can take it down, Jim. You don't even have... I don't know. He just pulls them down, pulling them down. Casting down vain imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Cast them down. You know what it means? Cast down in the Greek? Put a spear through it. You know what? When a thought comes your way that's not from God, spear it. I got a nice Swahili spear in my, my office. Got one in my house, one in my office, one under my bed, one in my car. No, I'm just joking. Spear them! Spear it! Right? Not spear it, like, you know, the Holy Spirit, but spear it. Spear it. <laughs> I got those short Zulu ones, too. Those are the ones you have to get in close to kill. Yeah, the Zulus made them this big, and it was not for cowards. You had to get in a close fight and then use that, 
that, that spear that's only this big. I mean, you've got to get it within close enough to put it through somebody's heart. Easy. <laughs> this is a warfare class. I can have a little liberty here. So it's like it begins with casting down vain imagination and everything, high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought. Now let me give you 10 points on what happens when you, when you uh, the thinking process. Are you ready? I got some of this from Dr. Stevens years ago, I think 1986. And I, I remember listening to a class on Christian psychology. Are you a psychological mess? And you need Christian psychology. I need counseling. So what are you going to do? Go to some lost person who is, can't even save themselves. Nobody can save themselves. But like, you know, it's amazing to me how people, you know, I, I, I got I to gotta bring my, I got to go to, yeah, I know he's not a Christian, but he really knows what he's talking about. Oh, really? How can he know what he's talking about? If he's not a Christian. Where's his thought patterns coming from? It's like getting advice from mommy and daddy who aren't saved. You can listen because you're obedient and you love them. But you make sure you filter it through the, through the doctrine of God and from the Holy Spirit. Okay, number one, you receive thoughts. I just received a thought from the telephone. <laughs> Receiving thoughts. Okay? Thoughts are coming from every direction. They come from outside and inside. Are you with me? They can be, they can be projections and they can be reflections. Where, where, where a thought comes from can be from within me and from without me. All right? So th there, there's all kinds of thoughts in the atmosphere. Remember, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Any thought that comes towards me that's not from God is from Satan. That I don't need to fear it, but I need to understand it. All right? We're to quench fiery death. So here comes the thought. What do I do with that thought? Well, number two, we think it over. We entertain it. All right? We meditate upon that thought. Here comes the thought, okay? I should, I should go to a movie. Did you hear about the latest movie? I cast that down. I'm not interested in the latest movie. Okay? I'm not interested. I don't need to see about the crucifixion from Mel Gibson, who's a pervert. I don't need to see that pervert's movies. That's just my conviction. And I'm saying it over the Internet. I don't really care. I didn't say it's the ministry. It's my conviction. All right? He's a drug-using, alcoholic, outside of marriage affair man. And I, he's going to tell me about the cross. <laughs> so I, 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 don't, I cast it down. Okay? Here comes the thought. Right? You, don't have the, you can't pray. I cast it down. I don't think it through. I don't, the second process is I meditate. And I think about it. I think about it. Every person that is a homosexual had a homosexual thought projected at them first. They weren't born with it. So stupid. Okay? Every person that committed a murder, they, they, there came a thought, right? They had to start with a thought. Every person that wanted to get high, that, that became a, a user of drugs, a thought came. It came from somewhere. came from a person without or came from within based upon what they've listened to. But it's all coming. It's a thought pattern. A thought comes, and I think about it, rather than knowing that this is warfare. A thought comes. Don't go to church. I think about it. Oh, I'm tired. Oh, my back hurts. Oh, i got to see him there. Oh, I, you know, I don't have any money to give tonight. Oh, you know, a thought comes, and we do what with it? We, either, we entertain it. Rather than cast it now, if it's a thought from God, we meditate upon it, right? But if it's a thought from my flesh or the world or the devil, I don't think on it. I get rid of it. I get rid of it. I don't play with it. How many of you like playing with large snakes? Anybody here? You don't play with a snake, do you? It's like playing with a lion or a crocodile. Before you know it, you're swallowed up and not in victory. You're swallowed up. Okay? So a thought comes. The second point was meditation and thinking on it. Number three, I make a decision. 
I make a decision. All right? Thought comes. I either get rid of it. But if I don't. Now, it could be a thought coming from God. So I think upon it and then meditate it. Then I make a decision. A decision of the will takes place based upon thoughts. People do not make decisions without receiving thoughts from somewhere. All right? They receive a thought from someplace. Somebody gets saved. I was talking to somebody in a way. Wendell, he was telling me how uh, he had an alcohol and drug problem for years. And the thought comes. You haven't used drugs for two years, three years, five years, six years. Why didn't you get high? Things aren't going well. Why didn't you get, take a drink? Huh? Thought comes, right? Take a drink. Take a, it comes in sweet little voice, doesn't it? Like that person that talks on that thing that you, people drive cars and they have directions talking to them. What do they call those things? GPS, I don't know. I don't like the voice of those people. I don't even like their voice. Turn right. Oh, shut up. <laughs> Turn where I want. <laughs> I'd rather get lost and listen to that voice all day. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding you. A thought comes. We meditate upon it. We think on it. And then we make a decision of the will. I mean, you know, Peter didn't just deny the Lord. He had to, a thought came, and he played with it in his mind, and then he made a decision to deny the Lord. This, in warfare, we've got to do what with the thought? Spirit. If it's not from God, kill it right away. Put a knife through it. Put a spear through it immediately. Now, I think I'll think about this for a while. We give, and by the way, I have a verse to back it up, Ephesians 4.27, give no place to the devil. Don't give an atopos is the word. Don't give a place to the devil. No place to the devil. Okay, so a thought, a meditation, or what the, the simple definition of meditation is I revolve something in my mind. All right? I revolve it in my mind. Like, like how about this one? You, you do, you, if you go, this is not a smart thing to go to um, Eurocon. Or to go to Zambia, you have a sciatic problem, you need a new hip and a new knee. And I take that thought and spear it. Tell it to go back to hell where it came from. And go. And have a great time. Huh? I'll hobble around with Jesus. I don't care. You know what? What's the worst that can happen to you? Somebody's got to carry you? Or you sit in a wheelchair? Big deal. <laughs> spear it. Doctor said, you, got, you, got, you don't have one thing, you got three things wrong with you. I said, you got a lot wrong with you. <laughs> you got an awful lot wrong with you, baby. You know, you're not saved, you need to be born again, and uh, your thought process is not good for me to listen to. I didn't go to, a, I didn't go to an office for that. You know, just somebody told me that. I don't even care if you're a Christian doctor. What the heck do I care about your Christian doctordom? Whatever. You know, I got Dr. Jesus. And the Holy Spirit will tell me what to do, not a doctor. I don't need a doctor to tell me what to do. I need God to tell me what to do. And he just might say, go forward, even though you have malaria in your eyes and you can't see, and you can't even write letters. Paul, the apostle. Huh? And Epaphroditus was sick unto death, but he kept serving. So what's the worst that could happen to anybody? Did you die? Wow. That's a sad thing, isn't it? Why, well, you like it here so much? Okay, warfare. It's war to get us out of the will of God. Next, an action takes place, number four. We think, a thought comes, we meditate upon it. Meditation means revolving it in your mind. I turn the thought in my mind. Okay? <laughs> you know what? I mean, come on. Like, you could have, you know what? Uh, this person would treat you better if that person was your wife. You don't need to stay with your wife forever. I mean, come on, it's been a long time. You know what? You meditated upon a thought that came and you took a decision and an action took place. Why do you think there's so many problems today in relationships and in marriage? A thought came. The devil said, how long are you going to put up with her? How long are you going to be married to her? How long are you going to be married to him? Him. You know, and the thought comes and I think it through. I revolve it in my mind. I make a decision and an action takes place. That's the fourth point. Number five, the action is now recorded in my memory. They don't just, we don't just commit an action and it goes away. It's recorded in the unconscious and subconscious mind. 
All right? It's recorded, and it can, be, it can be there in the conscious mind, but it, it goes into... Have you ever had thoughts pop out of your brain you don't even know where they came from? Hello? Ever happened to anybody here? What am I, like from an alien or something? They, they say, where did that come from? Your unconscious mind. Something that happened 30 years ago, 20 years ago. I'm not talking about let's counsel your past by having you talk about what happened in 1922. Well, you weren't even born then, so don't worry about it. Really, Right? You know, let's go deep. Let's take a recording. Let's take a little walk through your past. You take a walk through your past. I'm going to walk on my past in the finished work. So a rec- there's in the memory something after the action, it's recorded. Next, number six, thought comes again. All right? Here comes another thought based upon the same initiation that happened before. All right? If it's from God, hallelujah. If it's not from God, the enemy's saying, got you once, going to get you again. How many problems uh, and, and uh, sins and failures are repetitive? Huh? Repetitive. Here comes the thought again. All right? Then I make another decision. Number seven. I make another decision. Then number eight, a series of decisions, either right or wrong. I'm not talking about just bad decisions, but good decisions. A series of decisions. What number is that? Okay. Number nine. A habit takes place. You form habits. Now I'm a drug addict. You know, a dr- now I have a, a habit. And then number ten, you have an enforced identity. That's your identity now. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a drug addict. That's my identity. Right? I'm a failure. I'm no good. I'm not a good husband. I'm not a good wife. See, it's, it's, it's a procedure. Can I go through them again? Thought, meditation, number three, decision of the will. Number four, an action. Number five, the action is recorded in the memory. Number six, we think again. There's a, there's a, a series of thoughts coming again. We make another decision. A pattern develops a habit is formed and an identity is now locked in. And that's what happens. If we don't understand and, and understand the warfare. Now the devil wants to keep God's thoughts from coming in. So this, God wants his thoughts to be meditated upon, decisions to be made, actions to take place. That's recorded in our spiritual memory. We make a series of decisions based on thoughts again. A pattern takes place, a habit and an identity in the new man. So God's got... Well, this, it's, this can be of God or it can be of the enemy. All right? Very important. But this is what? It's called the thought warfare. It's, called, it's the warfare of what is coming at me. What is happening in my thinking? What's coming at me and where is it coming from? If it's from the pulpit, I'm getting thoughts from God. If it's from the Bible, thoughts from God. If it's from a tape, thoughts from God. If it's from a booklet, thoughts from God. Okay, thoughts from God. And I was listening to, to throne words. I forgot I was on the airplane. I, I did. I got up when it, when it was like we were supposed to get up. You know, fasten your seatbelts. I got up. I didn't even know what I was doing. I was receiving all those thoughts, 165 verses. I, I didn't even have a mind to make decisions at that point. That was the most important thing on planet Earth for me at that time, although I was hovering above it. Okay? So, so there's those thoughts, and they're coming in, and I'm receiving them from God. I'm receiving them. And that means finished work thoughts when I'm accused by the devil. That, that means thoughts in God and of God. And that's important because the enemy wants me, not to, he doesn't want me to receive God's thoughts. He wants me to receive other thoughts and then maybe he hides behind the world and the flesh. And he does not want me to know it's really him. For we wrestle not against what? Flesh and blood. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. My thoughts about Christianity for years were, it's nonsense. I would see the certain denominational person in my father's bar drinking. I'm like, how can he stand up on Sunday morning and tell me about God and Sunday night he's chasing women and drinking alcohol, smoking cigarettes? I'm like, it doesn't make sense. So I, that, my thought pattern in regards to Christianity was, no, null and void, it's out, I don't even care, I don't want it, None of that, nothing like that at all. But then I started to read the Bible. And I realized that the Bible was different than people. 
isn't that good? The Bible was different than people. And I began to see that. I was thinking today, just talking to so many precious people on the street today, like how many people have wrong thoughts about God? A man said to me, well, I used to be a Christian, but I messed up so bad that I, I'm, I'm lost. I said, liar. He goes, what are you calling me a liar? He says, yeah. I said, you believe the lie. I said, do you have a child? He goes, yes. I said, ever do anything wrong? He said, of course. I said, is he no more your son? He goes, I get it. I said, you get it? I said, he's always your son. Genetically, he's your son, right? So when you're born again, you have new genes. And you're saved forever. And you may backslide, you may be disciplined, but you are a child of God, and you have believed the satanic thought projection. But you're not a Christian because of your sin. When sin was paid for at the cross. Huh? It's warfare, isn't it? And so that starts with wrong preaching. Wrong messages. Pulpits that have nothing to do with finished work Understanding of victory. So the thought patterns, those 10 points, those 10 steps. So we'll take about a 10-minute break right here before all of you fade out on me. Go get a coffee and uh, have a good time. Father, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.